Hey everyone, it's one o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining this week for our seventh uh, Skillathon clinic workshop. We do have one more after this. Um, as a reminder, we do have our judge, our last judging Skillathon workshop or judging workshop on Thursday, and we're going to be going over cattle and. Um, uh, one more reminder that we I am starting the recording now, so we will get these up and posted to YouTube um, in the upcoming weeks so that everyone can go back and watch. Um, this week's topic with uh, today with Andy is hay and wool judging. I encourage everyone to ask as many questions as possible. Really understand this concept because this is where the most points are lost every year at our contest. Um, so if it's not a dumb question, please ask it. Everyone struggles with this. Um, every year when I go to create the contest, I have to go back and watch videos and reteach myself to make sure that I'm up to date and providing everyone with the best contest possible. So this is one of the hardest sections. So please, please, please be active and engaged in this one. It's gonna be a great one and this is where you can make up the most points. Um, so I'm, on that note, I'm gonna turn it over to Andy and I'm gonna make him the host. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Rachel said, yes, uh, what we're gonna be covering today is a difficult topic to teach virtually. Um, I played around with trying to take some pictures and video and it just wasn't working for me. But we're going to walk through the steps and I have some pictures um, and I'm going to talk you through all the steps to look. But this is one of the more difficult ones because it uses multiple senses. Uh, you're not just looking, but you're also maybe touching and feeling the weight like when we're talking about wool, um, using the sense of smell when we're talking about hay. Um, so this is one that's a little difficult to try to, uh, to do virtually, but we're going to talk through the important concepts and steps uh, for judging both wool and hay. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, so we're going to start with hay, and we're going to start by talking about the different kinds of hay uh, that we might see in a contest, the most common types of hay we would see in a contest. Um, being able to identify the type of hay that we're looking at uh, can help us make decisions on the placing of the class. Um, so I'm going to talk through several different types of hay, and they all have a very different appearance. So there's some similarities in appearance, but a lot of times there's some very different differences in appearance in the stem shape, the leaf type, and such. And, and when we're going to talk about the things, the things we look for in judging hay, we have to be able to realize the type of hay we're looking at so we can decide is that an appropriate stem to leaf ratio, uh, why does this hay look a different color than that other hay? Is it because of a quality difference or is it simply because of a forage type difference? Um, are all very important things to be able to, when we're judging a class of hay. Uh, most of the time when we're judging hay, it's hopefully all going to be of a similar type, there, but there could be some mixes. Sometimes it might be a grass hay class and you might have uh, one or two or mixes of different kinds of grasses. Um, Occasionally you'll find, we'll talk about alfalfa here in a little bit, you might have an alfalfa or alfalfa mix with grass in the class. And that can really, and being able to identify whether it has alfalfa or not in it is very important for being able to uh, make decisions on the placing because that changes the quality and the value of the hay quite considerably. Uh, we're going to start with fescue, a very common type of hay in the Piedmont and western part of North Carolina. They grow some in eastern North Carolina, but particularly in the western part of the state, western two-thirds of the state, they grow lots of fescue. Uh, fescue is a cool season grass. It is a bunch grass. Uh, it typically has a very stiff, uh, kind of a rough edge leaf to it. That's one of the ID points, it's kind of a stiff and a rough edged leaf. Um, they have a panicle seed head. So in the picture over here, you see the picture of the seed head's kind of a broad panicle seed head. 
And when we're talking about uh, cool season grasses, it has a very distinctive seed head from our other two most common cool season grasses that we may see. So being able to identify that seed head is very important. Fescue quality varies greatly, as do all hay, depending on the maturity of which when it's cut. We're going to talk about maturity quite a bit here in a little while. Um, but a really good high quality fescue hay can easily run uh, 16, 17 percent protein um, and be very high in digestibility and energy up in the 70s. But if it gets really mature, it's been kind of droughty, it wasn't fertilized, the quality of that hay can uh, be very low as well. So it has great um, variability in the quality depending on the environment um, and, the, and the stage at which it was cut at. So that's one thing to, to keep in consideration. The next one we're gonna talk about is orchard grass. This is another cool season hay. Um, it has a, as a, a bunch of grass as well. Um, we're growing a little bit more north of North Carolina. It doesn't like our heat and humidity in our summertime as much. Um, so it's a little bit more prone to drought stress and heat stress. Um, but it's still a fair amount growing in the state. And we see a lot of orchard grass uh, brought into the state from other places, particularly out of Pennsylvania and Ohio and New York, Kentucky, uh, quite a bit coming into the state. And we see a lot of orchard grass mixed in with, uh, with maybe a fescue as well. Uh, orchard grass has a very distinctive color. That's one of the ways it's easy to identify. It has a very distinctive blue-green color to the leaves. It also has this very um, distinct seed head. In our second picture over here, if you look, uh, we got, oops, went the wrong way here. Oops, went the wrong way. There we go. Uh, we see these kind of like little balls, like little round balls on a stem. That's the seed head. So the seed head is very distinctive on orchard grass. Uh, orchard grass has some advantages over our other two cool season grasses, which I'm about, particularly over fescue. It tends to be a little softer, softer in texture. The leaf is softer. The stems seem to be a little bit softer. So the palatability, which we'll talk about a little bit, is a little bit higher. And it maintains its quality better into maturity than fescue does. Um, while fescue can drop off pretty quickly as it starts to mature, get some drought stress, orchard grass tends to hold its, um, its nutrient value and its protein levels a little bit longer uh, into maturity than, uh, than fescue. So if we we're con comparing a mature fescue and a mature orchard grass hay in general, uh, the orchard grass hay is usually going to be of a better quality and more desirable than a fescue of an equal, of a, of a very mature uh, quality. When they're both in the immature state cut at the proper time, they're very similar in their protein and energy levels. It just, in, as it goes into later into maturity, the orchard grass holds on to it a little bit better uh, than fescue does. Uh, another one we'll see, particularly mixes or hay coming out north of us is Timothy. Um, Timothy really doesn't grow very well in North Carolina. It's even more susceptible to heat and humidity um, and just does not, you can grow it in a few places in the far western part of the state. Uh, there's some stands uh, they'll plant for a year or two, but then they die out in the west central and eastern parts of the state. We don't see a lot of Timothy, pure Timothy stands in North Carolina, uh, from North Carolina made hay, but sometimes we see it in a mix. It's very easy to uh, distinguish Timothy. It has a very distinctive head, a seed head. And the seed heads are really key guys for identifying the kind of hay we have. So they have these long kind of a little cone shaped, they are uh, cone shaped seed heads on them. Um, in general, Timothy is gonna be a little bit stimmier uh, at all stages um, than will be orchard grass uh, or fescue. While it's a bunch grass, it does spread with rhizomes. So it tends to be a thicker stand but it uh, stays fairly short until it goes into what we call the boot or reproductive stage when it starts to make a seed head. Um, and it's more susceptible, it needs to be more mature when cut it, when it's cut for hay to ensure a good, oops, good regrowth. Um, so typically when we're seeing Timothy hay, we're almost always gonna see seed heads and more stems in it than we are in some of our other cool seasons such as orchard grass and fescue. It's gonna look a little stemmier. Um, it has very small, very fine leaves as compared to fescue and orchard grass. Fescue and orchard grass has a much bigger, wider leaf than Timothy. Timothy has a very fine leaf. Uh, also has very fine stems, 
but it tends to have more stems present uh, as compared to the leaf, uh, compared to our other two cool season grasses. All right, now we're gonna move out of the cool season into our warm season grass, uh, Bermuda grass, very common in the eastern part of the state, our most common hay in the eastern half of the state. Uh, as you get further west with a little more clay in the soil and cooler temperatures in the mountains and such, they don't grow as much Bermuda grass, but in the sandy coastal plains, it's the most common type of hay we're gonna be growing. Uh, it is a warm season grass uh, as compared to the previous three, which are cool season grasses. Um, so meaning it's made in the summer months. Um, it's a high productivity kind of grass. It's uh, very different in its structure, how it grows. It doesn't grow as a bunch. It grows as a rhizomus, meaning it sends uh, stolons and roots along the ground that it grows from. Um, so it has a very different look. Bunch grasses kind of have the leaves coming from the bunch and then stems that come up individually with not many leaves on them. Bermuda grass comes up with a stem with leaves coming off the sides. So the stem structure is very different. In our bunch grasses, we have individual leaves and then individual stems in general. With Bermuda grass, you have a combination of the stem and leaf all together, uh, connected together. Bermuda grass also, when done right, has a very distinctive color. It's kind of a bright um, sea foam green almost kind of color to it. Um, it's definitely not as dark and green as orchard grass, uh, which is more blue-green, and fescue, which is more of a dark green. Um, so it has a very distinctive color. And I said the texture of it is very distinctive, the stem and the leaf being together. Um, it tends to be a little bit longer stemmed. Uh, um, if it has a very fine seed head. It has kind of a little, we call bird's foot seed head. If you look at it, it's got uh, four points on it. Uh, over here in the side here, you see the seed heads. Uh, they have little black seeds they can form on them. But the seed head is very fine and kind of wide, looks like a bird's foot. Um, so between the color and the way the grass is a stem with leaves coming off of the stem, and then our bird's foot seed head, Bermuda grass is very easy to identify. Being a warm season grass, in general, tend to have a little lower protein levels uh, and a little lower energy levels than cool season grasses. They produce more total volume of hay and forage when grown over the season, but the quality of it is a little lower. Bermuda grass is usually gonna run between 10 and 12% protein, but it could be a low, particularly if it's getting mature, it hasn't been fertilized, it's gonna run seven, 8% protein. So it can be really low quality. And that's very important to keep in mind if you have a scenario for the class, like you're feeding growing animals or animals that are, um, uh, late lact or in lactation, um, Bermuda grass hay may not be the best fit for a scenario because they tend to be a lower protein and lower energy than our cool season grasses. One that's uh, grown somewhat in North Carolina and is considered the queen of forages is alfalfa. Alfalfa has a very distinctively different look than our grass hay because it is a legume. Uh, it grows as a bunch but you have a stem with big broad leaves coming off of it. So when it's cut for hay, it looks very different. It doesn't look leafy. It looks like a combination of stems and little buds. Oops, I'm going the wrong way here. Um, or just individual leaves. Um, being a legume, it is very high in protein. Um, of all the hay we, get, we can have at the same, uh, cut it at you know, an equal, uh, maturity alfalfa is always going to be higher protein. We can have alfalfa running up to 22-23% protein very easily if it's cut immature and well managed. Even poor quality alfalfa will be in the 14 or 15% protein uh, levels which is about the tops that we can find for of our, even our cool season grasses. So it's always of a high quality um, uh, high protein. One thing that's uh, important to look for when we're judging alfalfa or seeing alfalfa hay, whether it be a pure alfalfa hay um, or a alfalfa and grass mix. So sometimes they'll have grass, particularly orchard grass, uh, mixed in or maybe timothy uh, mixed in with alfalfa. Is to look at the amount of leaf, the alfalfa leaves that are in the mix. The leaves are very delicate as this grass dries down. And if it gets some rain on it, 
or if it's mishandled and these leaves get dry and crumbly and don't make it into the bale of hay and you just have the alfalfa stems, the quality is not as good. The real high quality stuff is the leaves, guy. guys. So when we look at this, we wanna make sure we see plenty of alfalfa leaves in there. The other thing we wanna look at those stems, the finer the stem on the alfalfa, the better. Uh, as it gets mature, alfalfa kind of has a octagonal uh, stem. It has actually, uh, it's, it's hexagonal, it has six sides. And it can get really kind of big and woody and mature alfalfa. And particularly young animals uh, and sheep and goats may pick through alfalfa hay, but it has a really thick, heavy stem on it um, and, and not eat that. And then that's a loss out of that hay. So we want to see finer stems in the alfalfa as opposed to coarser stems. And we want to see lots of leaves, lots of leaves uh, in the alfalfa hay. Some other hay we might see that looks very different. Um, and if you're making comparisons against uh, one, some of these hays and other grass hays, uh, you may make a wrong decision because they have a very different um, texture to them. Uh, first of all, small grain hay. In particular, oat hay and rye grass hay would be the most common. These are cool season grasses that are annuals, meaning they're planted in the fall, they grow through to winter, and they are harvested in the spring. Almost all of our small grain hays we're going to harvest when they have a seed head. That's when we harvest. We wait till a seed head has formed on these grasses. Uh, particularly in the, in the instance of oat hay, it's going to have bigger, thicker stems uh, on the plant as compared to our other uh, cool season grasses. If you were to compare oat hay to fescue or orchard grass or Bermuda, you're always going to have a bigger, thicker stem. You're always going to have lots of seed heads, and you're going to have coarser, bigger leaves. This doesn't necessarily mean the quality is worse, but the palatability could be an issue depending on the animal that's eating it. Animal, uh, things like cattle, cattle don't, would eat this no problem. The big, coarse stems uh, are not an issue. They're going to eat it quite readily. Smaller animals like weanling lambs, um, young goats may pick more and not eat as many of the stems, so therefore it's less preferable uh, than something with a finer stem. But even though it has a thicker stem and the bigger, coarser leaves, a lot of times the quality is just as good as a, uh, a fescue or an orchard grass with having, you know, proteins in that 12 to 14 percent protein uh, and high energy levels in it. Rye grass is, it tends to be a little bit finer. Uh, than, than our other small grains. Uh, some other small grains we can see, we can see oat. Uh, we already see the oat here. We can also have wheat uh, or triticale or barley hay are also possibilities. Um, they're all gonna have kind of a coarser stem and a bigger seed head and big wide uh, leaves on it. Rye grass is a true grass and not really a grain, but we kind of consider it in a small grain because of a similar, it's an annual, we plant at the same time. Um, it's going to have a finer stem and finer leaves. It has this uh, seed head, uh, as you see right here. It's little, little seeds all up and down the single stem. So the stem comes up and those little seeds coming, popping off the side, called a racine head uh, here, popping off the side. So it's a seed head of a ryegrass. Uh, ryegrass is very high quality. It can be 20% protein very easily, easily digestible. Um, animals of all classes eat it very readily. Uh, so it's a really good quality hay. The biggest challenge was with, um, with ryegrass hay is making sure that it was put up right. We're going to talk about the factors. If it's put up with too much moisture and it heated um, or molded, it may have an off smell or an off color to it um, because it can be challenged. The time of year we harvest it and the type of leaf has a very waxy leaf on it. It makes it very difficult to get good and dry. So sometimes ryegrass hay uh, can be put up a little bit wet by accident and the quality of it may not be as good because it lost quality after it was put into the bale. And our final one we're going to talk about, which is a very different looking hay, is Sudan grass hay. So this is also another annual hay. This is a warm season annual hay and it's a tropical grass. This comes from Africa. Um, it's planted in the spring and in, in May or June. It grows really tall before we cut it. It may be three, four, five feet tall before we cut it. So it has a very large stem on it. Compared to all the other hay, there's no hay you're gonna see that's gonna be any stemmier. It's gonna have these really big leaves on it. 
And so it's a very um, coarse, we call it coarse hay, it's not fine texture. Um, even though the quality of it can be quite, is very excellent, it's very high in sugars, so it has a lot of energy in it, the protein levels are usually pretty good on it, um, but it looks very, it looks very coarse. And we talk about palatability, particularly for younger animals like calves, weanling calves, uh, lambs, young kid goats, this hay may not be quite as acceptable because it's coarser stemmed and they're going to pick through it. They're going to eat the leaves out and keep the stems back, even though the quality is very good, just because of the size and the stem of the hay. This is another one we really need to look at the quality of when it was put up. Um, it's a very, it's a big thick stem. It stays very juicy. It's got a lot of sap in there. Um, it can be difficult to get dry. Sometimes you'll see uh, heat damage, mold damage, um, or if the hay's been stored outside in a round bale where it wasn't covered because it's coarse, the water runs through and you can get some uh, weathering damage very easily to uh, Sudan grass hay that's stored outside. All right, we're getting ready to move into the characteristics of what we look for when we judge a hay, but I'm going to stop right now. Anyone have any questions about different types of hay, uh, identifying hay, the different types of grasses that we may see, or the type, you know, the, the, the uh, warm season versus cool season or annual versus perennial. Anyone have any questions on that? Isn't alfalfa a legume? Yes, alfalfa is a legume. That's the, of all the ones we have looked at, alfalfa is the only one that's a legume. That's right. Um, and because it's a legume, it is very high in protein. Some other legumes we may see in hay, usually not as a, um, a full bale of hay, but sometimes we'll see clovers, white clovers or red clovers, particularly maybe mixed in with, uh, with the orchard grass or fescue hay. We may see uh, clover in there. We want to, if we see that clover, that makes that hay of a better quality because that's a legume as well. And it's going to bring that protein level, which is important sometimes in hay, up. So if we see clovers in there, see grass and clover or grass and alfalfa mixed together, that's usually going to be better quality hay than just straight grass hay. Any other questions? I think I'm going to go to this next slide to show you this here. So just in general, it, there's a lot of variability of when the grass was cut, when it was fertilized, or how it was fertilized, and how it was stored that can change the quality. But in general, if you were comparing forages cut at the same kind of maturity and the same fertilization, in general, alfalfa is always going to be the better hay, followed by our cool season perennial grasses, and that was our fescue, our orchard grass, and our timothy, followed by our cool season annual grasses, which was our oat hay and our rye grass, followed by our warm season perennial grasses, which was our Bermuda grass, followed by our warm season annual grasses, which was our um, Sudan grass. So if you had, you know, if you had a mixture, if you had something, you know, like a, you know, when you go to class, just like we're always going to have four different samples. If you had one that was a sample that was straight alfalfa, and one that was straight orchard grass, and you had one that's orchard grass, alfalfa, and a Bermuda grass, hay, all in the same class, just by looking at the type of hay it was, you could almost place the class. It's going to be alfalfa, the alfalfa grass mix, the cool season orchard grass, followed by the Bermuda grass. You could almost place it without even looking at any other factors, just on quality. If they were look very similar in quality, the color's good, that there's no other big weeds or other things in it, if they all look very good quality hay, and the only difference is the type of hay, you can almost place it just like that, just based on the, on the type of hay it is. All right, so when we're looking at a class of alfa or a class of hay, our priorities, just like in livestock judging, we have priorities. The first thing is maturity, and we're gonna talk quite a bit about maturity. That's the biggest influence on the quality of the hay is the maturity, how mature it was when it was cut for hay. Next is palatability, and that takes in a couple of different factors we'll talk about. If there's any foreign material, the odor and the color are also of consideration. But maturity, palatability are the two most important things. So when we're talking about maturity, that is the life cycle, stage of life cycle, it was when it was cut. Um, we can tell the maturity of the grass or the alfalfa by looking to see if we see any seed heads 
for grasses or blooms for alfalfa. So alfalfa is being a legume has a little purple flower on it. It makes just like clover has flowers or if the clover in there, you'll see red or white clover blooms in there. Um, or seed heads. If the seed heads are soft and immature, there's not actual, we can't shake the seed head and actually get seed to fall out. That's kind of a young seed head. But if it's a seed head, it's brown, and it's got seeds in there, we can actually pull out. It's fairly mature. That means it's of a lower quality. And I'm going to talk real quick about why that happens. So as the grass grows, um, it uses sunlight to make carbohydrates and sugars and proteins, and it stores those in the leaves of the plant. But as it reaches maturity and it starts to ready to make seed, it pulls all the protein and the sugars that it has uh, in the leaves and it puts them into the seed. It moves, it transports it through the plant and up into the seed head. And that seed head gets big and heavy. And to hold it up in the air, it puts a lot of fiber, it makes very uh, hard fiber in the stem of the plant. So the plant gets woodier and stemmier and harder and it moves all the good things, the protein and the energy and the leaves of the plant and puts them up into the seed. And then when we cut the hay, the seeds kind of mature and it starts to fall out of the seed head that lays on the ground, never makes it in the bale and the animal never gets that energy and that protein when it eats the hay. And the hay that it's trying to eat because it's stemmier is harder to digest. So if the plant is more mature, it's gonna have less protein and less energy in it than one that has younger and less mature. So that also goes back to stem size. If we see big, thick stems and seed heads, we know that the plant is fairly mature. If it's very fine stemmed and doesn't have any seed heads in it, then it is less mature. And we gotta remember, you gotta be careful to look comparing stem size across different species of grasses. Like I said, you know, uh, fescue is mostly leaf, it only has grows a stem for its seed head, whereas something like Bermuda grass always is going to have a stem with the leaves coming off of it, and something like Sudan grass is always going to have, also has a big thick stem with leaves coming off. So the, the stem size is relative to the type of plant it is. So you, you can't compare the stem sizes between a fescue and a Bermuda grass, but you can compare stem sizes between two different samples of Bermuda grass hay. Palatability, and palatability refers to how well the animal wants to eat it and how well they're going to digest it. And the most important thing in palatability to look for is the leaf to stem ratio. We wanna see more leaves than we see stems in the hay because the leaves are where most of the uh, digestible energy is. Those thick stems are harder to digest than those leaves. So we wanna see lots of leaf and smaller, finer stems. We've already talked about the stem size. But the other thing in palatability is that it's soft or rough. The softer the hay, in general, means that it has more leaves because leaves are softer than stems. And the stems are finer than uh, something that's harder or stiffer or rougher. Um, so if we look at it, if we touch it, and put our hands in it, if we just feel it, just squeeze it down. If it squeezes down real nice, then it's soft. If it squeezes down, it's hard to squeeze. It kind of stabs your hand then it's rougher and the palatability is going to be lower. So looking at the texture, whether it's soft or rough, has a lot to do. A softer hay, animals are going to eat better, particularly young animals. Um, young calves, young goats, young lambs, they're going to eat that softer hay better than something that's harder, stiffer, and rougher. A mature, now the scenario says you're feeding mature dry cows, some of that rougher hay is quite acceptable. They'll eat it just fine. But younger animals have more tender mouths. They're gonna be more selective and more picky, and they're not going to eat that rougher and tougher hay. Okay, also important is foreign material, something that's not supposed to be there. Um, you know, and particularly the number we look for is weeds. Um, and in particular, we want weeds that are poisonous, thorny or woody are very bad. If we see weeds in there, a lot of weeds, that hay is probably going to go to the bottom of the class. Obviously, if it's poisonous, we don't want our animals eating it. If it's thorny, they're not going to eat it, or if they do eat it, it can stab their tongue, they can stab their gum, and then get an infection in their mouth. 
uh, or if it's woody, if there's a hard stem, a big thick hard stem, particularly some weeds have big thick woody stems on them, the animals are gonna pick those out and not eat those stems. So if we see weeds, that's not good. That hay's gonna go down towards the bottom of the class. Other grasses, if we are judging, say it's a type class, right? So if we're judging a class of orchard grass hay, and we start seeing a lot of foxtail, which is a bad grass. We see foxtail in there. Or if we're seeing um, Bermuda grass mixed in with the orchard grass, it's supposed to be an orchard grass hay class, right? And it's got other kinds of grasses mixed in. That's going to move its way down to the class. So if it has a type to it, it's supposed to be grass hay, or it's supposed to be, or it's supposed to be um, say it says it's supposed to be uh, or, or alfalfa hay, and we're starting to see a lot of grass mixed in with it. That's going to be close when we move it towards the bottom of the class. And the final thing, trash. What I mean by that is there are pieces of plastic or paper in there. Um, and this can be a real problem because, or pieces of metal. Uh, if stuff gets out into the hay field and gets rolled up in the roll and baled in the hay and the animal eats it, that is very detrimental. Plastic in particular is a major problem, whether that be a plastic bag, uh, pieces of old baling twine. Uh, a balloon that's floated in. If that sort of stuff gets bailed in there and the cattle or whatever animal eats it, that is very bad. It's very likely gonna kill the animals. We don't wanna see any kind of trash in there, uh, in the hay. That's very important not to see that. That's also gonna put it down to the bottom of the class because that's indigestible. It's gonna make the animal sick if they eat it. Okay, so then the odor. When we're judging a class of hay, we always wanna smell the hay. So that tells us a lot about uh, the quality of it. It should smell sweet and clean. Different kinds of hay have different smells, just like different animals, like pig smells different from a sheep. Different kinds of hay have a different kind of smell to them. Oat hay smells different, Bermuda grass hay smells different than orchard grass hay, smells different than Sudan grass hay. But then in general, they all, if they're done, put up uh, properly and of good quality, they're gonna have a sweet and a, a kind of a pleasant odor to them um, that, you know, that animal would be wanting to eat. If it smells sour or moldy or musty, those are all bad things. That means there's something wrong with how it was, uh, before it was put up, it got wet. It was too wet when it got put up and it started to heat and ferment and mold. It was stored outside, got some rain in it, and then molded after it was baled. Um, all those things are bad because it makes the quality go down. Animals are not going to eat it as well. So we don't want to have a sour, a moldy, or a musty smell to the hay. Oops, I missed color. Okay, so I, I missed color in there. We should have a color slide. I thought I had a color slide. I don't have my color slide. Oh, there it is. I make my slides got out of order. There's my color. I'll go back to the summary here in a minute. Uh, so color. The color can be also a indication of quality. Uh, greener is better than being brown or dark colored or yellow colored. Um, so you want a, a bright green color is a good sign. If you're seeing a mixture, some leaves are green, but you all see a lot of brown leaves and brown stems. That generally means the plant has gotten more mature because that leaf has died. Um, and it sent that energy up into a seed head or the grass is starting to shut down because it has reached maturity. Um, and those leaves are not gonna be as nutritious as a green leaf. Now there can be things that the hay has been store, uh, stored outside or if it's been stored in a shed but where it's got sunlight to it, sometimes the outside of the bale will turn kind of a brown golden color but inside it'll be green as, as normal. And if so it's just brown on the outside but green inside, of the slice, then that's not a problem. Uh, that's not affecting it. If it's golden or brown color all the way through it, the whole bale is, that's a sign that it hay laid out in the field for a long period of time and probably had some rain on it, which makes it of a lower quality. The other thing we want to see, do we see any mold, uh, kind of hard compacted areas in the bale? That's a sign that it got wet or had heating in it. Um, so those things are not uh, what we want to see. We prefer to see a bright green color over something that has brown, dark, or yellow colors in it. So in summary, when we're judging a class of hay, we want to come up and see if we can identify 
the type of hay. If it doesn't tell us, if it just says grass hay, we want to look at it and see if we can identify what kind of grass it is. So then we can have a kind of a guess of the quality of it, right? Cool season uh, forages in general are better quality than a warm season forage, like Bermuda grass. Um, and you know, a, an, an oat hay is always going to be stemmier than a ryegrass hay. So that sort of thing we need to be able to take into consideration. We want to look for seed heads because seed heads are a sign of maturity. And the more seed heads we see, the lower quality the hay it is. We want to look for weeds. If we start seeing a lot of weeds in there that don't belong, that's lower quality. Or if we see big, thick stems, that's also bad. We always want to see more leaf than stem. And that depends on you know, alfalfa or any kind of a grass hay. We want to see more leaf than stem. And finally, we want to smell it. We want it to smell sweet and inviting and not sour or moldy or musty. Those kind of hays are always going to be of a lower quality. Okay. Any questions on judging hay before we move to wool? All right. Very good. All right. We're going to talk a little bit about wool judging. So when we judge a class of fleeces, we don't see in, in our area, we don't see you and, and work with this very frequently. We can find some good quality hay to judge. We make a lot of hay in North Carolina, but we don't do a lot with wool judging and it can feel very intimidating, um, but it's really not that hard. It's a few simple things, the steps we're gonna walk through. And it just one of those ones you should, you know, if you get a chance to look at different kinds of wool, take a chance and look at those wools and see the difference. But the most important things when we're judging wool is the fiber length, how long each individual fiber of the wool is, the color of the wool. We want a bright, white, lustrous color that can take a dye unless it's a natural color class. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. The weight. So if we have a whole big fleece, we're gonna talk about this, these terms here in a minute. We wanna pick them up because you get paid by the pound for wool. So the more it weighs, the more you get paid for it. And finally, cleanliness. Is it mostly wool? Is there other foreign stuff in there that we don't want in there when we uh, want the wool? So we're gonna talk about, so fiber length, the color, the weight, and the cleanliness. Things that are pretty obvious and very easy to compare between, uh, between, the, class, between the fleeces. We always got four in a class. Um, so this is one where, with, not, with just a little bit of practice, you can get really pretty good at judging wools and really make up some points for somebody who hasn't really thought about it or learned about wool, wool judging. It's pretty easy to make some pretty easy points in judging a class of wools if you just follow these few couple of steps. So some of the terms, we're gonna go over all of these terms here in a minute. Well, these are important terms to know uh, when you're judging a class. And that is gonna be fleece and staple and lanolin and yolk stain and crimp grease weight, natural color, black fiber, and kemp. These are all important things we're gonna be looking at and looking for and evaluating uh, when we judge a class of wool. All right, we're gonna talk about fleece, grease weight, and staple. So a fleece is all the wool that comes off of one animal when it's sheared. When you shear, if you shear them properly, it's gonna come off in one big piece here. You got the front back legs and the front legs, the bellies on the side, the neck, or it's the front legs, back legs, necks up here. So this is a fleece, the whole fleece here. That fleece is then taken and put in a ball and tied up with paper twine. And so this is a fleece. So if you're going to a contest that has fleeces, this is what you're going to see sitting on the table. It's a big ball of wool. When you approach the, fl the fleece, first thing you want to feel is the grease weight. The grease weight is how much that fleece by itself weighs with the lanolin and everything else in it, how much it weighs. So you're gonna grab it by the twine with one hand, pick it up and actually feel how heavy it feels in your hands. And you're gonna compare that weight, but you also can kind of compare the size of the bundle of wool to some extent too. And if it's kind of a bigger ball than one next to it, it's probably gonna weigh more, it's a bigger fleece. Um, so you're gonna feel the weight. 
The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take your fingers and you're gonna grab a lock of staple out of the fleece. You're actually gonna pull a piece of the wool out of the fleece. And we're gonna look at it. And so this is what we call the staple. A staple is a piece, a lock of wool uh, in its raw state. And in that lock of wool, we're gonna evaluate it for several different things. We're gonna look at the length of the fiber. How long is the fiber? The longer, the better. What is the crimp? We're gonna talk about crimp here in a minute. How much lanolin do we see in the fleece? What's the color of the fleece? Can we see any differences in the fiber diameter uh, or the fiber color? Okay, so the staple is the little lock here we're gonna pull out of the fleece, it's a staple. So one thing we look for is the lanolin. And we want to look for it that it's um, because the lanolin is what majority of the weight of the fleece is. Um, if it has a lot of lanolin and it's a small fleece, it may weigh just as much as the fleece next to it that's bigger with less lanolin, but the bigger fleece with less lanolin has more value because there's more actual fiber in it. The lanolin is a natural grease that the sheep produce in their skin that is inside, it goes in through the wool. And what it does, it protects the wool itself from uh, getting waterlogged. When a sheep uh, stands out in the rain, what happens, the outside edge, the weathered edge of the fleece here will actually get some water in it. But deep down in the fleece, that lanolin is water resistant and that water won't soak down into the fleece and soak the animal to the skin. So they actually stay dry underneath their fleece. So that's the important part of the lanolin. Um, but that lanolin can also have some detriment. There's value to that lanolin. When they take the fleece, when they clean it, they remove that lanolin. It is used in hand cream and leather conditioners um, because it makes things very soft. It makes them waterproof uh, for leather and skin. Um, but that lanolin naturally has some color to it. And that color is generally kind of a yellow color. Um, and that actually comes a little bit, it's affected by both the breed of the animal some animal, some breeds tend to have a heavier uh, lanolin in them, a thicker lanolin, um, and it really depends on the environment that the animal was uh, grown or raised in. Some animals, particularly our English breeds, they were called the low country sheep in a wetter environment tend to have a heavier grease as opposed to sheep with a, a drier climate or a higher altitude and climate with less moisture in it. They didn't have a lighter grease, depending on you know, the amount of rain they had to fight off. Um, but also what they eat, the plant material they eat can change, or the feed they're on can change the consistency of that grease. Animals that are fed a very high protein diet tend to get a lot more what we call yolk, or a yellow color to that lanolin. And a heavy yellow lanolin in here can actually stain the wool fiber so when they scour it, which is the process they call cleaning it, to make it white, um, it takes more scouring to get it. It doesn't come to that same bright white luster after cleaned as one that has a light lanolin in it. So if you see a heavy yellow lanolin color to it, that is a lower quality than one that has less yellow color to it. So this is called yolk staining. So it looks like the yolk of an egg, that dark yellow or orange color in the fleece. So then the crimp. And the crimp is the amount of wave it has over the length of the fiber. Um, this crimp is very important for the weaving or the whole. So when we take this uh, fiber and they cart, they clean it and they cart it all out. It's this crimp when they twist the fiber together, that interlock with each other that holds the fibers together that makes the strength of the yarn uh, or the um, string that's being made of the wool is directly related to not only the length of the fiber, but the amount of crimp in the fiber. A fiber that has less crimp, less wave to it, is more likely to pull apart than one that has more crimp, because these crimps interlock together when they're twisted up, and they actually hold tighter, so you make a tighter uh, and a finer uh, quality yarn uh, from that wool than one that is uh, less crimp. So more crimp is desirable, um, particularly in length. A longer fleece with lots of crimp is much more uh, desirable than one that is shorter 
and has less crimp. So imagine you have uh, a fiber that's three inches long with lots of crimp and one that is an inch and a half long with just a little crimp. You know, those short fibers, and they'll have a little one, maybe two wa a wave and a half, two waves in there. They're not going to hold together as one that's three inches long and has all these little waves in there. It's going to lock together and make a much nicer, stronger piece of yarn that can be used. It's going to hold together in a piece of cloth a lot better. But when we have that um, lock of fiber out here, uh, we're going to look and see that differences in the waviness. You can easily see the differences in the waviness and that crimp of our piece of staple there. So we're going to look at the staple, we're going to look at the length, we're going to look at the color, and we're going to look at the crimp from our piece of staple. Uh, something else we're going to do is look at the strength. I forgot to put a slide in here about strength. Um, we're going to take, we're actually going to grab both ends and we're going to yank it. And if it breaks, the fiber breaks apart in the middle, that's a bad thing. That's a low quality fleece. When sheep get sick, they get a fever for several days. It actually causes a break or a weakness in their wool fiber. And as that wool grows out, that weakness stays in the middle piece of the fiber. So think about it. If you have a little bit of, you know, sheep got sick for five or six days, ran a pretty high fever, you got just a little small section of wool in there that's just a little bit weaker than all the rest, and you take and you yank it and it breaks, that means that fiber doesn't actually have this good length to it. It's only, you can only measure it to whatever, wherever it breaks is the natural length. So when you run it through the carding process uh, and the processing to straighten and align all these fibers, they're going to break when they get carded if they have that uh, fever break in them. So we want to take that lock of wool and yank it and see if there's a strength of it and make sure there's not a fever break in the middle of it. Then we're going to look at the color of the fiber. In general, we're looking for a bright white luster to the color. Unless it's a natural colored class. If it's a colored class of wool, then we want that wool color, the color is acceptable. But in general, we want a bright white fiber is what we're mostly looking for because it can be dyed any color as desired by the processor. Something that is a brown or an off gray or a black, it really cannot, it's going, the only color it can be is really the color it is uh, or some darker hue. It cannot be, you know, you can't take this gray here and dye it bright yellow or orange. It's not going to take that color. Whereas our white lock here in the middle will take any color we want to give to it. So we want to look, if it's a not, you know, if we're looking at white wool and not a natural colored class, we want all the fleece to be white. Occasionally, in some of our black face breeds, we will see black fiber start to move in in spots, particularly along the back legs, uh, sometimes over the shoulders. Sometimes we get spots of black in there and we get a little bit of black wool. And that makes that a lower quality fleece if we're starting to see some gray or black fiber in parts of the fleece. And preferably, if it's all white fleeces, we wanna see a bright white color to all the fleeces. And something that has a little gray mixed into it is gonna be of a lower quality. Unless it's a natural color class, then we don't, we ignore um, the, the color. If they're all colored fleeces. Something else you wanna look for is called kemp. And kemp is hair fibers mixed in with the wool. Um, and, and this happens particularly along the, the bridge and the legs and the belly, maybe coming along the head where you get some hair fibers. And some breeds uh, will actually have a little bit, sometimes can have a little bit of hair moving into their, uh, into into their wool or if they are a crossbred that has so low percentage of uh, Katahdin in it maybe, or something like that. Sometimes we can have these Kemp fibers. And you can see this is a natural color fleece, a light red, but it has all these white hair fibers uh, mixed in. They are coarser, they are straight, um, and they are a different color. They won't dye the same. They structurally are straight, so they don't have that natural wave or kink to them, so they don't weave as well. That's unacceptable. We do not want to see Kemp fibers inside of our fleece. So we start seeing Kemp in our fleece, that's a low quality fleece is gonna to go towards the bottom of the class. We're gonna look at the cleanliness of that fleece. 
Um, and you can imagine when we, you know, we're going to take that wool, we're going to have to clean it. They call it, they wash it and they scour it and they card it uh, to make it a, you know, a, a bright, clean, acceptable color, be ready to dye and turn into clothing or whatever. We don't want any foreign material. The less foreign material there is, the easier it is to clean um, and the brighter the color it's going to be. Fleeces that are burry are always going to be towards the bottom of the class, particularly here in North Carolina. We're talking about cockleburs and sandburrs in particular. They get into wool. They're very hard to remove. Uh, other parts kind of maybe some other weed seeds that kind of cling tight and things like that. They actually have little hooks on them. They're going to hook into the fleece. It's going to be very difficult to get removed from the wool fiber. Any kind of that, that's a very bad knock on that fleece and it's going to go towards the bottom of the class. The other thing, any kind of polyester fiber in the wool is a no-no. Once again, it is a synthetic fiber. It's not a natural fiber. It doesn't dye. It doesn't have a natural kink to it, so it won't um, bind into the yarn being made. Where this contamination comes from is from hay twine and feed bags. Poly hay twine and poly feed bags, if some of that fiber winds up in the wool, that's a very, very bad thing. It gets, uh, because when it runs through the cleaning process and the carding process, it doesn't get separated from the wool fiber. It gets mixed right in. And then when they go to dye it, it doesn't, you know, it keeps its color, it doesn't dye, and then it wants to pull out and hang out. And it's very coarse, uh, it's unacceptable in yarn. So we do not want to see any kind of polyester fiber inside of our fleece. Uh, then organic material. Some of our organic material is always going to be present uh, in a fleece. That's just that. They're a natural living animal out in the environment. They're always going to have some kind of organic material contamination in their fleece. It's the amount of organic material contamination we're going to look at. If they've got a lot of it, or one fleece has more than the other, that is a uh, knock against that fleece. And what we're talking about is manure, um, dung locks around the bridge, around the belly. Um, Hay, we've been feeding hay in an overhead feeder. They get hay in their feed. If they're feeding them in a feed trough, you can throw feed over and you're getting feed down the back of their neck. Um, those are always, those are things that are not uh, as acceptable as a cleaner fleece. So the cleaner the fleece from organic materials, the better. There's not automatically a bad thing. You're always going to find these things in fleeces, but less is better than more. And then finally, dirt. If you see a lot of dirt in the fleece, that makes it more weight, but that's something that's going to wash out. It's not lanolin and it's not wool fiber. Dirt does not have use. That's going to the junk. So dirty fleeces. Um, and this is a particularly a problem if you're seeing fleeces that are stained with clay. Um, people from the Piedmont of North Carolina, if we get a wet winter and they got kind of a muddy lot, clay lot where sheep have been out and they get a lot of red clay in there, that's going to cause staining in the fleece, red clay staining in the fleece. And that is not as acceptable as one that is of a cleaner and less dirt in there. So I was looking for less dirt. All right, so when we look, we come to a class, a judging class of wool. Here are the steps we're going to use. First of all, you're gonna grab the fleece and pick it up, hold it in one hand or both hands and compare the weight between the fleeces. Feel how much it weighs. You're gonna reach down you're gonna grab a lock and pull it out. And you're gonna look at it for its length, how long it is, how much crimp does it have? What is the color of the fleece? Give it a yank and see if it's strong, make sure it doesn't have a break in the middle of it. And then we're gonna just look at the fleece in general for foreign material. Does it have any burrs in it? We see cockle burrs, sand burrs in it automatically if it has some of those it's going to the bottom of the class. Does it have polyfiber in there? Goes to the bottom of the class. How much dirt does it have? How much hay does it have mixed into that fleece? How bright white is the color of the fiber? And then we'll be able to make a decision. The important things are length, weight, and color. Those are the three most things in, in importance. Um, because most of, most of your fleece you're going to find are not going to have a huge amount of foreign material, not have a lot of black color and fiber in there. So that big difference is really going to be the weight of the fleece and which fleece is longer than the other. Um, 
And that can really make the big decisions, guys. You, you know, most time you're going to see some pretty big differences uh, in the weight or the length of that fleece. Something that's really short, if it's less than an inch and a half or two inches long, um, that fleece is a pretty low quality. We really want wool to be over two inches in length uh, for it to be of a, a quality that's going to be able to be spun into high quality clothing. Wool that's less than a, an inch and a half or an inch long has to be felted because the fibers are not long enough to interlock with each other to make a good quality yarn. So short fleeces are not of good quality. You want a long, a nice long uh, fleece with plenty of crimp in it. All right, any questions? So that's kind of, uh, we moved through wool pretty fast. Um, and it's one of those ones that just takes, um, anytime you get a chance to look at some different fleeces, if you know somebody that has sheep and they're shearing, uh, and you can look at different fleeces and kind of make some of those comparisons. This is one I really like to do in person. So I bring in some wool and you can actually grab it and feel it and see those differences. I tried doing it in a video and it just, it was hard to make any actual comparisons uh, with what I was trying to make with the video to show this. So you couldn't, of course, feel the weight. Um, and it was just hard to see the color differences and stuff with the video I was trying to do. Um, but if you ever get a chance to actually get and be handle some fleeces, you can, and just remember to look for these differences and it's not that hard to judge a class of fleece of wool. Any questions? All right, if not, that's what I have for you today. I guys hope you guys learned something. Um, and I said, this is one you should practice. If, uh, if you have animals at home and you're buying in some different kinds of hay, um, go out and look at it and see if you can spot the differences. Um, if you, uh, you know, I said, you know somebody with some sheep and they're shearing, take a look at some different, uh, different types of wool and different fleeces and see if you can see the difference. When you hold it in your hands, you can really see that difference in the length and that crimp and that sort of thing. Um, and so I, I've kind of gone over the basics today, but if you get a chance to look at them in real life, that can really, uh, really help you see what you're looking for. All right. Hope you all had a great day.